Okay, we're back. We're live. It's uh, Monday. This is Think Tech. Think Tech Global, to be specific. And it's 12 o'clock rock. Uh, today, we have the honor of Ralph Kosa. He's the president of Pacific Forum, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, connected with Washington, the original CSIS in Washington, uh, and the Kennedy School, and a lot of think tank people who deal in foreign policy and diplomacy. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. Great to be here. You know, um, the, the world is different now. It's certainly, it certainly different is. domestically, but it's also different in terms of foreign policy. And you know, you could not really uh, sort of mm, get your mind around where all of that would go before the election, because you really couldn't see it real time. Now it becomes more real time, even though Donald Trump is only the president elect. So uh, we'd like to discuss that today, Ralph. Sure. Uh, you wrote a piece, a PACnet piece recently, um, and it was uh, what uh, should Trump's Asia policy look like uh, and what should Japan's policy to the Trump administration look like, and for that matter, Asia yeah. policy. And he made some statements uh, in the course of the campaign uh, which suggested that he wanted, he wanted to take an entirely different tack on dealing with Asia and the pivot and uh, all the issues that surround it. So uh, I guess the first question I would ask you is um, how important to United States, the, the benefit of uh, the United States and its people and its future is foreign policy in Asia? Is this important to us or can we marginalize it? Well, I mean, first of all, you're talking to someone whose think tank focuses on Asia security. So if I told I you Asia answer, wasn't yeah. important, yeah. This, would be a, this would be a great shock. But, you know, Look at the numbers. Look at the amount of our trade with the Asia Pacific. Look at who the second and third largest economies in the world are, both in the Asia Pacific, where number one, China, then Japan. Uh, this is not an area that we can ignore, and it's an area that we get wrong at our own peril. It's also an area that has a lot of countries that have nuclear weapons. Uh, including the North Koreans, uh, who we're very concerned about. So both from an economic and from a security standpoint, this is a very critical area for, for U.S. national interests. How would you characterize our, relation, our national relationship with Asia, with China, Japan, Korea, North Korea, and so forth, uh, and the ASEAN countries? Okay. How would you characterize that right now, here in the closing weeks of the Obama administration? Uh, it's good. Uh, it's a lot better than a lot of people complain. It's not as good as it could be or should be. Uh, and right now, there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, I just came back from China last week. Uh, I was supposed to be talking about the next administration's foreign policy. I had a great presentation prepared, and then two weeks ago, Tuesday, <laughs> came along, and I said, whoops, okay. <laughs> everyone's guessing. So, uh, you know, everyone's, everyone's nervous right now. There's a lot of anticipation. So he's the president-elect, not the president. That's right. And it'll be uh, until you know, January 20th uh, yeah. when the Obama administration is still in office. But he does things and makes statements, sometimes the same as what he said in the, uh, yeah. you know, the campaigns, and sometimes maybe a little different. Um, what effect do his statements and what effect do his moves right now have on the nature of, of that policy? I think they're magnified, Jay. And I, I would say, you know, so far, not so bad. Uh, I'm not prepared to say so far so good, but at least uh, not so bad. He's walked back a couple of things. You know, Abe had a good dinner with him and came away encouraged, whatever that means. He had a very constructive conversation with President Park Yun hye in Korea, uh, where he reaffirmed the importance of the alliances. Uh, he tweeted against the New York Times that they were, they were wrong when they said that he was looking forward to having more countries with nuclear weapons. Uh, so these are all things that are sort of walking back uh, some of the positions that he had had or were ascribed to him previously. And in each case, uh, I think he was walking back in the right direction. <clears throat> you know, uh, in, in the campaign, um, there, uh, there was a lot of acrimony. Um, but now, after the campaign, people in the country, a lot of people in the country, Republicans and Democrats who spoke against them before, are walking back in yeah. that regard. And they're saying, like, you know, uh, George uh, Mitt Romney, yeah. uh, you know, comes to uh, Trump Tower right. and makes, tries to, yeah. you know, make, make nice, make, yeah. make a relationship with Trump. Um, and a lot of people are doing that. They're, they're finding a way to be optimistic about him. Yeah. And, and, and my question is, that, uh, are Asian leaders, for that matter, European leaders, also trying to find a way to make nice, find a way to open a, a dialogue that will be better than what you might have expected given Trump's remarks during the campaign? 
Uh, actually, it's exactly what I would have expected. Uh, I had a very uh, bright, uh, distinguished uh, diplomat slash politician who once told me, whoever the president of the United States is and the prime minister of Japan is, they will become one another's best friends. The same holds true for whoever the prime minister of the UK is. Uh, national interests drive you. Uh, you can't afford to not be friends with the prime minister of the UK or, or with Japan and vice versa. So they're obviously now searching for, for common ground. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, the article that you mentioned, our, our PACnet, which is available to your viewers uh, free of charge on the internet. Uh, Address right. pacificforum.org. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I said in there, experience tells us 50% of what any candidate says is wrong. Uh, is not true. Uh, the challenge is figuring out what 50 percent. And, and with, with Trump, we're hoping it's more going to be like 70-30. Uh, and I think it will be. Uh, I think it will be, because at the end of the day, A, reality sets in. B, we have checks and balances. You know, if you want to build a beautiful wall, the Congress has to fund it. Well, the Congress is talking about, well, maybe we'll have a fence or maybe we'll have a drone or something like that. So, you know, reality sets in. Uh, Ronald Reagan was going to recognize Taiwan. Uh, Jimmy Carter was going to pull all, all of our troops out of Korea. Uh, you know, then reality sets in when they become president. So I, I, I think we shouldn't spend an awful lot of time trying to go back and hold him to some of the silly things that were said. Instead, we ought to be applauding when he seems to be moving more uh, in the, the realistic uh, direction. Yeah. <clears throat> but what I get from your remarks today is that, uh, on the one hand, reality sets in. It's the only diplomacy is, is fun is based on reality. Yeah. Um, yeah, on the other got, hand, you got to start from where you are. But and, they're true. They're yeah. true feelings, and the feelings of the people behind them, the governments behind them in Asia, for yeah. example, uh, must be at a level of concern because the statements are made before. So, if you have, you know, on the face of it, yes, we we want to make friends. We recognize the reality that you were elected. Yeah. On the other hand, you have made all these statements that give a, such yeah. concern. How does that affect their actions? You know, since they they likely worry yeah. about some of those things coming true? Uh, you walk on eggshells uh, for a while until you actually get to meet face to face. And, you know, I've, I've never met him face to face, but people say he's a charming man. And, and as a businessman, he knows how to, how to finesse things and how to, how to tell people what they want to hear. Uh, you know, there's, there's two sides. Uh, eight years ago, expectations were so high uh, for Barack Obama. He was so welcomed because he was going to bring about change and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that he actually had a hard time living up to uh, the expectations. Uh, it'll be a lot easier for Trump to live up to the expectations <laughs> right now because they're pretty so low. low. <laughs> and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. You know, eight years ago, you'll agree that the world yeah. was different. I, absolutely. In, in terms of yeah. Thomas Friedman's process of globalism and all yeah. that. Um, and um, uh, so we're now we're globalized. We're more globalized. We were eight years ago. And yeah. uh, my question to you is, how does that process of globalization, which is, may I say, global? Yeah. <laughs> you can coin that phrase. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh, how does that? You affect, heard it here first, yeah, folks. Thank so, you. Yeah. <laughs> how does that affect uh, diplomacy and policy in the international uh, arena when you have globalization, more interdependence yeah. than than yeah. was imaginable a few years ago? Yeah. Well. Well. It, a, it means that what you say and do matters to more than just you or your voters. Uh, and most presidents grasped that pretty quickly. Most of them knew that before they came in. Uh, I, I don't believe Trump is a dumb man. I think he understands all of that. And just, uh, again, uh, we've got very small tidbits to, to latch on right now. But if you listen to what Pak yun hae said he told her in their conversation, uh, this says the man gets it, he understands the anxiety, he understands the need for an alliance, he understands the reassurance aspect. And at the end of the day, it comes down to reassurance, reassurance, reassurance. Uh, that's what a president needs to do, that's what a president-elect needs to do. I'm hoping we'll see a little bit more about that. Uh, right now, everyone is watching for one key announcement, and that's who will be Secretary of State. Uh, and that will tell us a lot. <coughs> good or bad and and you know we sort of cross our fingers and hope for the best on that one big question is is trump's uh, you know method of operating which is 
derived from his business experience or has been successful in his business experience, uh, winning by intimidation, if you will. Does that work in an international setting? Can you, can you actually achieve things by, by trying to win through intimidation? Uh, depends on who you're trying to intimidate. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, what we've discovered over the last 50 years, both Republican and Democrats, both softies and hardliners, uh, is that North Koreans aren't easily intimidated. So, mm -hmm. you know, you try to give them a threat, they respond in ways that are not very pleasant. And, you know, every, every president goes through his dance with the North Koreans to figure out what's the, what's the right thing to say. Uh, Chinese are not uh, easily intimidated. There are some countries that have no option but to be easily intimidated. So it, so it varies, and, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, and again, uh, when you're doing business in those countries, you understand you have to do business differently in Japan than you do in China or than you do in Europe. Uh, so hopefully this carries over. It's, it's a level of sophistication that a president yeah. must have, or if he doesn't have it, he has to learn it. And, and he has to have people around him who who know it. Yeah, touche on that. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, I would take it from the remarks in the campaign that Trump did not know, has not known very much about the finesse points of, of doing diplomacy in Asia Pacific, but that he might be a quick learner. Yeah, A, I think he can be a quick learner. Uh, B, we may all be whistling past a graveyard here. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be yeah. very upset in a couple of months. <laughs> but I, I prefer to think about the positive outcome until somebody convinces me it's the, it's the negative outcome. And keep in mind, uh, Trump was masterful, absolutely masterful in playing to his audience and winning the election. Uh, people in Japan weren't voting. People in China weren't voting. People in Europe weren't voting. He was, he was aiming his comments toward the Rust Belt, and it, and it was successful beyond anyone's dreams. I mean, I was with the group of everyone else that was assuming, you know, who's going to do this for Clinton and who's going to do that. Uh, we were all kind of shocked. So, A, don't underestimate the guy. Uh, B, don't assume that he's going to talk to the rest of the world the way he was talking to the people who he was trying to get their vote, uh, because that's what politicians do. Uh, and uh, he was a very quick learner as a politician. Yes. Uh, so now let's hope he's a quick learner as an international diplomat and leader. Okay, that's, those are the general points. Yeah. <clears throat> we're going to take a short break. Uh, we're going to come back with Ralph Kosa, president of Pacific Forum CSIS. Uh, we're going to get the advice that he would offer Trump as to how to conduct Asia foreign policy. In one minute, we'll be back. That'll Good. be really interesting. Boy, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. We highlight success stories in Hawaii of both businesses and individuals. We learn their secrets to success, which is always valuable. I hope to see you on our next show. Aloha. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. Um, we are here to show you news, issues, and events local and around the world. Join me. Okay, we're back. We're live with Ralph Kosa, President of Pacific Forum, CSIS, which is a an international diplomacy think tank right here in Honolulu. And today we're talking about what, what should uh, Japan's policy be? What should uh, Trump's policy be to Asia? And what should Japan's policy be to the Trump administration? It's more than Japan, it's all of Asia. Yeah. So let's, let's look at it from the Trump point of view first. Uh, what would you suggest that the United States does, that he does, uh, and that his Secretary of State does going forward in, you know, in, in 2017 um, to uh, what was the term you used uh, to bond up um, and connect up and stay connected with Asia? Yeah. You know, in, in real estate, it's location, location, location. In government, it's reassurance, reassurance, reassurance. Uh, I 
I believe there'll be a lot of continuity in, in our policy, but I think that they need to hear from Mr. Trump about that continuity. Uh, so if, in fact, he told President Pak all the things that she said he said, uh, he needs to be saying those to the general public. Yes, I recognize the importance of our alliances, and recognize the stability that an American presence and commitment in Asia and in the world uh, matters. Uh, I understand NATO is important. Uh, and these type of things. I, I think that one of the, one of the important things uh, that he needs to look at is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, he ran against it. So did Hillary. Uh, Obama ran against NAFTA. Uh, Obama ran against the Korean Free Trade Agreement, and then he implemented it. Bill Clinton ran against NAFTA, and then he was hanged by Trump and others for being Mr. NAFTA. Uh, you know, it's fine when you're running for office to, to run against free trade, uh, but when you're the President of the United States, you need to take another look and say, okay, how do we fix this? We don't throw it away, we fix it. Uh, how do we engage with China? How do we not start a new Cold War with the Chinese? And I think that's critical, uh, and I think to do that, you need to at least indicate that that's your, that's your desires. Uh, Global warming is another issue, which, you know, we take personally here, <laughs> living on an island. Uh, and uh, is Trump really a denier? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what he really thinks. I don't know what he really thinks about anything. That's that he, true. Uh, All those honest, statements that he made, yeah. we don't know if he's, he really means it or whether he's going to do yeah, it or not and, do it. and a lot of things contradicted other things that yeah. he said. So, you know, let's forget about holding him accountable for all of the contradictions. All and past. instead, let's say, okay, here we are. You got to start from where you are. Here we are today. Global warming is a fact. You can say, yes, it's because of coal, or you can say, no, it's because of something else, but it's still a fact that we need to deal with. How do we deal with it? I'll tell you, it was personally embarrassing to me. I was in China last week, as I mentioned. The Chinese were lecturing us, lecturing the Americans in the room about how we needed to take climate change seriously and how we needed to do all these other things. And I said, boy, talk about turnabout You're being really fair play. All the things we've, you know, lectured the Chinese on, they're now, you know, you guys need to be responsible stakeholders. Yeah, well, you know, unfortunately they're right. Next, next uh, thing you know, they'll be lecturing us on human rights. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that comes next, I guess. Well, you know, what, what about some of these specifics? Uh, for example, um, uh, the pivot, okay? The pivot is dead, but long live the pivot. How That's does that right. work, I, and how should it work now? Yeah, I mean, the pivot is dead, long live the pivot. What I'm, what I'm saying there is that the pivot as a term, the rebalance, was an Obama term. But the decision uh, for the United States to focus on Asia occurred under the Bush administration, the George H.W. Bush administration, 1989, the East Asia Strategy Initiative, which essentially said the 21st century is going to be the Pacific century and the U.S. needs to be fully engaged. True and important. Important in 1989, in 91, then in 93, Bill Clinton issued an East Asia Strategy Report, which said everything that H.W. Bush said was true, uh, and this is where we need to focus. George W. Bush got sidetracked with, with uh, Iraq. Iraq. But George W. Bush also began the U.S. enhanced partnership with ASEAN, with Southeast Asia, because of a recognition that this area is still important. Obama reaffirmed it. Uh, the pivot was a terrible term for the right policy, which was reminding people that, that we affect on it. Now, if Hillary had won, she would have come up with a new term, even though she invented pivot, because that's Obama's term. She right. had to have her own. So, yeah. so uh, Trump will come up with a new term at some point, which will say what everybody knows, which is that Asia is important. We need to remain engaged there. We need to focus on it. That's why the pivot may be dead, but it's still in another name, in another you know, buzzword. We will continue to do that because it's in our national interest to do it. Remember, you know, the, Churchill said, you know, Americans do the right thing after exhausting all other possibilities. <laughs> We've spent the last year exhausting all other possibilities. Now it's time for us to do the right thing. What happens in a practical sense if the people that he was talking to, the Rust Belt, um, you know, they, they bought it. They yeah. bought it that we should close the borders, that we should ignore Asia, ignore Europe, pull out of NATO, uh, you know, stop the Chinese and whatever they were doing, and fold in on ourselves and become, uh, you know, a self-reliant new manufacturing yeah. center, whatever he had. And the, and the Rust Belt relates to that. That's why yeah. they elected him. 
Now he goes and he does a new, a new newly named pivot. Um, he's going to have some problems with his own constituents. Uh, uh, will he? I really? Mean, his, I don't know. his constituents, uh, I mean, the amazing thing is that, you know, when they did the, the polling after the election and all of that, half of his supporters didn't believe he was really going to do the things that he said he was going to do, but they hoped that he was going to get more jobs. Uh, if he creates more jobs, they could care less what his policy is toward China. Who cares That's an important yeah, point. about China policy? The experts care about China policy. The national security advisors care about China policy. The people in the Rust Belt could care less. Yeah. If the Chinese come in and open up a factory in, 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 they're, they're happy. in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be thrilled. And the Chinese are prepared to do that. Yeah, they are in doing fact, it. they've been trying to do it. And the Republican Congress has been saying, oh, we can't have the Chinese come, you know, come here, come there. Uh, so, uh, you know, that... That could be a that could be a real plus. At it the could end be of a solution day. in part yeah. to satisfy his own promises. Yeah. You know, Bring we, the Chinese here to manufacture in the that, U.S. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, it's, and it's going to happen. It's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. just just as the Japanese are building you know Toyotas in, in Ohio and, and and elsewhere, the Chinese will be opening up plants there yeah. because they've got a lot of money and they don't know what to do with it, yeah. and, and they yeah. understand the the benefits. I mean, this is the whole philosophy uh, from Nixon on down. We create this economic interdependence. Uh, it started with us putting in a lot of money in, into China, uh, but now that the Chinese have money, you want to have that come back. Just as you know, the Japanese, we were building plants in Japan, now the Japanese are building plants in the United States. This is part of the interdependent uh, world economy that, that's going to that's gonna continue. And, and we want and, that. And we want that. We don't want the Chinese folding in on themselves either. You know? no, Nobody no. should fold in on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what about uh, nuclear? You know, we have nuclear issues. Uh, yeah. Trump mentioned it a number of times in his campaign. We have the, the specter of North Korea. Uh, what should American policy to Asia be on nuclear proliferation, non proliferation? Uh, number one, we have to be very clear that we don't want to see more countries with nuclear weapons and that our security assurances to Japan and Korea are aimed at providing stability and also removing their reason or excuse for having to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, if, if Trump believes, or if anyone around him believes, that the world is more secure if more countries have nuclear weapons, they need to explain that, and they need to re-examine that. Uh, but I haven't heard that, and I haven't heard that from Trump. You know, instead, he's tweeting that the New York Times was lying when he said, I wanted to do this. You know, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? So, you know, <laughs> so let's go with that. You say, good, you're right. Sorry we made that mistake. Now let's, let's talk about you know, non-proliferation, because that's key, and it's key to our interest. There's some crazies out there that would like to get their hands on nuclear weapons. North Korea is not the big problem, quite frankly, because North Korea knows if they ever used one, North Korea is removed from the face of the earth. But ISIS could be a problem because who are they? Where, where is their country? Yeah, you, How do you, you can't put them off the face of the earth. You can't deter yeah. them because you don't know where the hell they are. So yeah. uh, in places like that, you've got to make sure that the bad stuff doesn't get in the wrong hands. Uh, that requires a very tight, enforceable non-proliferation regime, which is what we've had and what I believe we'll continue to have because it's in our national interest. And, and that, that means that having a relationship with China, where we can ask China to apply pressure on North Korea and anyone else yeah, who likes but, to proliferate. But, you know, one of, uh, I think, the sillier comments by Trump was, well, we're going to just have China take care of the North Korean problem for us. The, the Chinese aren't going to solve our problems for us. The Chinese will only do things that's in China's national interest. So we need to sit down with the Chinese and say, here's why it's in our mutual interest to make sure this guy doesn't do X, Y, and Z. Uh, the Chinese are already making sure they don't do X and Y. But we've got to talk about Z. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to talk about you know, tightening up that, the border security and not letting information get in and not letting stuff get out. And the, the Chinese have a vested interest in that. So uh, this is an area where we could have common ground. But, but to expect that the Chinese will solve our problems for us is, I think, hopelessly naive. And Trump isn't the first person that had that idea. This is something that's repeated over and over and over again as if somehow that'll make it true. Uh, Obama didn't really <clears throat> achieve uh, uh, any um, slowdown in China's um, 
uh, manifest destiny over the China, the South China Sea. Um, and I wonder if uh, well, Trump has said, I think, that he wants to stop that. Um, but can he stop that? Is that within this policy of engagement and reassurance, do you think? The Chinese are going to do what they feel they need to do in the South China Sea, and they've done it. Uh, and they've created new facts on the ground, uh, just as the Russians created new facts on the ground in Crimea. And, you know, if, if anybody thinks they're going to be able to get Crimea back or get those islands back, you know, let's forget about it. These are new facts on the ground. Let's go from there. Uh, and in my view, I don't lose a lot of sleep over a couple of artificial islands. Right. Number one, uh, the Hague Tribunal has already said these are not, you can't even clear 12 mile nautical limits around things that were, you know, submerged at, at high tide previously. Certainly you can't declare economic zones about it. So once every six months or so, you conduct a freedom of navigation operation just to, to remind people and then you go on. Uh, if there was a war in the South China Sea, I don't want to be stationed on one of those islands because it's bye-bye, <laughs> fellows. So, you know, during, during peacetime, it, there's some psychological value to it, and the Chinese are certainly exploiting that. But part of that psychological impact has been to get more and more people asking for the U.S. to stay engaged. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to backfire on the Chinese in the long run, and we just need to play it uh, smartly. Yeah. And what about uh, ASEAN? Uh, ASEAN is uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and yeah. it's in play somehow. It's, what should Trump's policy be toward um, you know, engaging with uh, ASEAN? Uh, it's got to be more of the same. Uh, and, you know, again, we've got to recognize the, the real effort to uh, re-engage ASEAN began with George W. Bush. Uh, it was continued, expanded by Obama, because it's in our national interest. And those 10 countries together make up an important trading block. There are a couple of them that are basket cases, but for the most part, these are very critical uh, countries. Uh, and right now, of course, the wild card is Duterte in, in the Philippines. And mm -hmm. uh, he would do better for himself and for his nation if he thought a little bit more before he spoke. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, as President Obama said, he's a colorful guy. Uh, Two colorful guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would I would love to be the fly on the wall the day that he and Trump get in a room together to talk about foreign policy, but uh, I don't think I'll be invited to that meeting. <laughs> well, one, let me take uh, one minute now yeah. uh, and uh, talk to Mr. Trump, yeah. uh, President-elect Trump, and give him a synopsis yeah. of how you like him to how you suggest he, he think about foreign yeah. policy in the world today when he takes office. Yeah. Uh, Continuity is important. Uh, reassurance is important. Reassurance, reassurance, reassurance. And that's, I think, the thing that we need most to do. Uh, we've got to understand the importance of our alliances. We've got to keep those alliances strong. We've got to reassure our allies that we are there for them and we expect them to be here for us. And nonproliferation is an important issue. These are all bipartisan issues. There hasn't been a Republican versus Democrat position on these. These have been constants, uh, and and we need to we need to stick with that. You don't. You can during a campaign you can talk about tearing up agreements with Iran or with NAFTA or something else. As president, you have to sort of take a look. Maybe you can quote fix them, uh, but you've you've got to you've got to stick with them, and you've got to understand. When the United States government commits to something, that's a U.S. government. It's not a Republican. It's not a Democrat. It's not a Nixon or an Obama. It's the U.S. government, and we have to stick with that and then go from there. You start from where you are, and you've got to understand where you are in order to build on that and not start tearing away and throwing out the baby with the bathwater, as they used to say when I was a kid. Thank you, Ralph. Ralph, uh, Ralph for COSA Pacific uh, Forum, from your lips to his ears. Yes. Thanks, Jay. <laughs>